can start. So uh, welcome to uh, what is the uh, inaugural uh, lecture of the Aminator series, which is a newly established uh, series. And um, as I remind you that it will consist of um, three lectures. This is the first one. Um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Gigliola Staffila. She's the um, Abby Rockefeller Mays professor at MIT. Uh, before getting there, she um, studied at the University of Bologna, then she moved to the U.S. in the University of Chicago, where she wrote the thesis under the direction of Carlos Kenning. Uh, she held a position in uh, Princeton, Stanford, and Brown before getting to MIT, and we are very proud to say that the very first postdoctoral position that she had was actually here in 95, 96, if I remember correctly. So um, she has been given a number of honors. Uh, the most recent one, she been elected a member of the, National, of the National Academy of Sciences. She was already a member of the um, um, uh, Academy of Art and Sciences, the American Academy of Art and Sciences. Uh, she's been given the uh, uh, Marconi uh, Prize, I think in 2020. Uh, what is perhaps most impressive to me, she's been, um, ambassador for her native region in Italy, which to the world, which looks like a near impossibility for a mathematician, right? uh, <laughs> because it's really uh, given by uh, uh, a society. And um, well, if you don't know where Abruzzo is, um, you probably just ate the pasta from there at uh, the IAS <laughs> restaurant. So you can, you know, take a look at the uh, pasta brand uh, next time that you pass over there. So she's a renowned expert on uh, dispersive um, uh, PDEs, uh, let me just mention the fundamental contribution as a member of the I team to the well closeness of uh, Nolina Schrödinger and KDB. Uh, in the last decade, she's been one of the pioneers of the um, um, probabilistic well closeness for dispersive PDEs. Uh, she's been interested in um, derivation of uh, effective equations from uh, many body systems, and um, you could, could go forever. Let me just go and give the word to her. She will talk about the study of wave interactions where beautiful mathematical ideas come together. Thank you so much, Camillo. And uh, first, I would like to thank everybody for the invitation. And also, um, I understand that this uh, lecture series is supported by the foundation. So thank you to the foundation for that. The next thing I want to say is that Camillo and I share the same high school because he's in a different region, so he's not an ambassador for my region, but for different regions, but we went to the same high school at different times, of course, Camilo is much younger. So thank you for the introduction, Camilo. Okay, so in this, as the title here says, this first lecture is going to be a little bit of a, um, a mosaic of different kinds of topics that I had encountered through my studies of this first CPD. And uh, I will point out where um, I will expand on in the lecture number two and number three. So you will have a little bit of a flavor of uh, what those lectures are going to be like. And if what I say is enough for you, then you, know, you don't need to come to the next lecture. <laughs> but I hope you will, because you will see the details. So today is no, I'm never going to go very deep into it. But in the next two lectures, I will develop two of the topics that I will present. So I always like to start with pictures because, you know, uh, this uh, sort of a first lecture called Locking Style, at least that's how I interpret it. And somehow these pictures show up in my different talks because they represent both real things like, okay, uh, the rainbow here and this is laser light, but also represent things that you find more in when you do some more abstract mathematics and uh, everybody that has harmonic analysis recognize this as the parent tree. And, uh, and here we are counting how many of the lattice points on Z2 are in a special uh, ellipse. And um, here you see both Einstein condensate and this is a, a fiber optic thing. So you would see this picture maybe through the talks again, but uh, this is to signal the fact that it is both something very concrete and something very physical somehow. Um, okay, so um, I started, as Camillo mentioned, as a student of Carlos Koenig, and certainly I'm not an expert in harmonic analysis, but I have to learn it because it's definitely together with Fourier analysis, I think them together somehow, uh, are, are the tools that we use in order to understand in particular the nonlinear interaction of waves. So when a wave is very complicated, that's what we do as mathematicians, we split into small 
parts or simple parts and then we reconstruct. The reconstructing part is what, in my view, is a fundamental um, um, element of harmonic and Fourier analysis. And uh, the hardest thing is trying to not count too many times, right? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of flavor of that. So certainly harmonic analysis and Fourier analysis are expected. Clearly, analytic number theory is something that I was not expected to find when I was looking at interaction in waves, but it shows up. Of course, math physics, because the dispersion equations that we uh, study are given to us by physicists and they represent specific phenomena. So therefore, that's that dynamical system. Now, a lot of probability, if anybody has been following what's going on in the, in the uh, dispersive uh, world, there is a lot of probability that's been used. And then when I even hear talks in number theory, I see a lot of probability being used. So it seems the probability is now something that it's really helping quite a lot of different uh, areas of mathematics. And I will not get to the symplectic geometry, but that's also something that uh, we, um, we look at. I would say the simple part of symplectic geometry in the sense that if you, for example, take um, nonlinear Schrodinger equation in the periodic setting, you can think of it in the physical space, that's the equation that you know, but you can also think in the Fourier space, and then the real part, the imaginary part of the Fourier coefficient of the waves becomes the variables of an infinite dimension Hamiltonian system, and hence you would like to understand whether theorems such as the no squeezing is something that holds in that infinite dimension. And there are some results, but certainly we don't understand everything at all. And clearly, well, why do you want to do that? Well, that's fun because you go from a dimension to infinite dimension, but also gives back information on behaviors of waves, which then are relevant for the system itself. So there is this uh, communication. I will try to give you just a few examples of this. So this was the idea of the title that uh, we are doing interaction ways, but really there are a lot of different mathematics that come in. Okay, so I will need to use at least one equation to, to present things. And I'm gonna use the one that is more common. This is the Schrodinger equation. I'm going to use it um, in the sort of nonlinearity, but the first nonlinearity that makes sense, really physically, that's the cubic nonlinearity. And uh, um, let me parse a little bit what uh, the symbols are. The I is really the complex I, partial derivative with respect to T, Laplace with respect to X. So U is really a function in time and space. <coughs> the lambda here, for now, just think about plus or minus one, is the situation which you have defocusing focus in case. Later on, towards the end of the talk, I will be talking about uh, dispersive equations with weak nonlinearity. With that, I mean that this lambda is gonna go to zero. But for now, let's just think about plus or minus one. We give an initial profile. I'm gonna call it U0x. And for me, throughout the talks, um, this x is gonna be a torus. Um, and here I put dimension d, but most of the examples I'm gonna give you is gonna be in dimension two, which is the first kind of more interesting dimension to look at. Why torus? Well, really what we mean here is that we are considered a periodic case. So the, these are dispersive equations, meaning that the, if you do not give boundary conditions, then at least the solution of the linear problem is gonna um, be such that as t goes to plus or minus infinity, the amplitude goes to zero by maintaining the energy, which is something interesting and kind of mind boggling, right? The, the wave shrinks to zero, but the energy remains constant. But if you have boundary data, that's no longer true because there is effect, effect coming from the boundary and the, in a sense, easier situation to look at when you have boundary data is the torus because you have a Fourier series and we can do a lot of calculation. There are, in fact, many other results on general compact manifolds, but I will not address that here. Okay, since this comes from physics, they're gonna be conservation laws. And the first one is the mass, which turned out to be the autonomous norm square. The second one is the Hamiltonian of the energy, which is given by the kinetic part and the potential part. And this lambda shows up here again. So if lambda is a positive number, then having this um, energy Hamiltonian conserved means that in particular, you have a bound on the energy. You have already the conservation of the mass. Together, you have the H1 bound. 
So this kind of problems, you wanted to solve them in within um, what makes sense physically, which think about, for example, within the H1 norm. Of course, when the dimension becomes higher and higher, the regularity is not going to be enough to do this, and then we're going to see what happens. I'm not going to address throughout the talk the situation where lambda is negative, because that will imply there is blow up, and this is not going to be what I would be talking on this talk, although there are um, really cool things happening. Okay, so where does the Schrodinger equation come from? Well, it shows up in many um, different kind of physical phenomena, but I just wanted to introduce one, um, which is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. The yeah, Einstein was here, so this uh, seems very appropriate. Um, and we start with the uh, um, imagined um, container with diluted gas. So these are the particles of the gas. But what we are interested in is not um, understanding or having a statistical behavior of the gas at this temperature, but instead understanding what happens as the temperature goes to absolute zero. So in order to understand um, the phenomenon and really come up with an equation that uh, tells you how, you how you move from the interaction of these uh, uh, particles to this picture down here, well, we have to start with the first principle. So what is the type of dynamics that happens between the particles? Well, um, if you are at this temperature, that will be, well, particles will bump into each other and you will assume that it really behaves like a balls in a billiard table. But here we are talking about different kinds of phenomena. We are not at this temperature. So the best, better way of describing the behavior of the interaction with particles to think of the particles as a little wave packet. That's why you see here in the second box. And if the temperature is not at the critical level, the distance between the wave packets and the wavelength are not comparable. But as you lower the temperature, they start being comparable here. And the weird thing is that uh, um, the independent little wave packet, they sort of forget their independence and they, they coalesce in one unique big wave. That's what the giant matter wave is. And uh, um, mathematicians have uh, worked on the problem of understanding this uh, um, rough picture here uh, mathematically for quite a long time. And uh, let me tell you a little bit how this is, the <laughs> this is the setup that is a, a really expanded in a beautiful series of papers by many authors, but let me just summarize a little bit what happens here. So like I say, you start with wave packets, and of course they have some interaction among them, and uh, you get this uh, so-called BBGKY hierarchy. So these are equations that uh, um, are coupled and they tell you how this wave packets behave. Then you take a limit. Okay, so you can reformulate the theorem, the, the, the situation, instead of taking the temperature goes to zero, you can reformulate as the number of particles goes to infinity. And once you take this limit, and this is not trivial at all, um, you get down here and you have the so-called gross petersky hierarchy. Each of these equations is actually linear, but there is obviously an operator, annihilation and creation of uh, these particles, if you want. So each one is linear, but there is a um, coupling among them. And uh, it's supposed to represent this. So let me give you a little bit of math behind this. So um, let's think about uh, the following. Um, think of the dimension three so that we are in, the, in our world here. But each of these xi represents a uh, um, particle, if you want. So in this uh, description, I'm gonna have a k of them. And I wanna tell you where the Schrodinger equation comes in. So let's assume that this is the initial data on my gross Petaviesky hierarchy, which I didn't write because uh, it's not important for you for this talk to know how it looks like. I say it's an infinite number of uh, equations, linear and coupled. And now here I'm gonna stop at the level K and I'm giving you this initial data, which is the product of an initial profile zero and with respect to this J one to K and it's conjugate. Okay, so this is just think of it, the initial data of the hierarchy. Then you evolve and you wanna understand what happens. So when it evolves, it turns out that this um, um, product here, it evolves into a product of uh, functions u now. And this u happened to be the solution of the cubic Schrodinger, um, nonlinear Schrodinger with the original uh, profile u0. Now, 
proving that uh, if you define gamma to be this with this solution, that this gamma is solution the gross potential scale, it's actually not hard. You can do the calculation and you see that if you start with your zero, you evolve with an LS, you take the product, this is solution with gross potential What is hard is proving that it's the unique solution. And that <laughs> took quite a lot of time. Here, I'm just gonna remind you a few uh, people that worked on this. Um, originally started with Spawn, then Erto, Schlein, and Yeah, they had a series of paper around 2007, just to, to give you a little bit to when this problem was solved. Then Claire Macedon had a, a different approach, and uh, with uh, Kirpak and Schlein, we uh, looked at the periodic case, um, and then Thomas Chen and Natasha Pavlovich and X Chen and Homer, they work extensively on that. Okay, this is, yes. Why is there X prime there? Why there is what? X prime. Ah, okay. This it's a it's um the way the gross Petavinsky is uh, written and it's yes it's uh, I'm just saying the way it's uh, this is what makes sense for the way they, there is a um, interaction with different particles and uh, um, so I just want to say the connection but uh, one has to look at the whole setup to figure out why it's this way. Okay. All right. So now uh, there is one um, feature of the NLS one dimension cubic that I would like to um, stress in the next couple of slides. This is the integrability. So if you are in one dimension, then this NLS has a particular um, structure, a really powerful structure, and I'm going to call integrable, it's an integrable system. Now you can find, there is not a unique definition of what an integrable system is, but certainly when you think of an integrable system and you think about the fact that there is a lax pair, that there, are, there is an inverse scattering map and so on, or theory, there are in particular infinitely many conservation laws. We already encountered two of them, that was the mass and the um, energy, but if you are in dimension one and you're cubic, there are infinitely many of them. They look like the integral of one half, then the derivative of order s squared, plus lower order terms for any s in n. And there is an algorithm that you can follow that tells you how these uh, um, rooms or these energies are uh, of different uh, order are produced. Now, one question that uh, my uh, friends, Natasha Pavlovich and Rihanna Mod and my former student, uh, Dana Anderson asked, is well, if there is such a structure for the 1D NLS and the 1D NLS is linked uh, with the gross potential in the way I mentioned before, what well, shouldn't be thinking that maybe this uh, um, integrability of this, at least the fact that there are infinitely many conserved um, quantities right here, shouldn't that come from the gross potential? At least shouldn't be something related to that. And we thought that uh, maybe that was already um, available in the literature. We start looking around and we didn't find anything. So we decided that we want to try to see if we could prove uh, a theorem that tells us that this also the gross Pitaliski is an integrable system, of course, in the same dimension, the same type of nonlinearity. Um, now, we did prove that indeed the gross Pitaliski has conserved quantity. Of course, when you go from uh, uh, NLS to the gross risk, you go from function to functionals, all of that, but we proved that. And we had a very nice interaction and connection between these two. But we also knew that uh, the NLS had a lot more structure than just the integrable, um, uh, the, the um, infinite conserved law. There is quite a beautiful geometry and um, underlining the integrability of the 1D NLS which we had not found yet for the gross potential. So then we, basically this is the picture that we had in mind. So up here, you start with the many body system. Thinking you know about you had a complete set of integral? Mm -hmm. How do you define that you were integral? Yes. You, you made so a definition. For which one? For the NLS or no. the gross potential? No, NLS or no? Yeah, for the, that was exactly the point. What we could prove at, and I'm going to go back to that, what we could prove at that particular, that paper was just the existence of uh, infinitely many conserved quantities. And they were related to each other. 
And you don't have a complete in any way. And then, yes, no, we, yes, exactly. And, but we wanted to provide a little bit more. So that's what, uh, so this is the picture that we had in mind. So we started with the many body system. This is the uh, lead away packet, BBGKY. And up here, there is nothing, you know, conserved. I mean, at least we, we don't have it. We don't, yeah, we don't have anything specific. Then there is the gross Petavieski down here, the Schrodinger. Now down here, there is a very rich, like I just mentioned, structure. So there is a, we know it's a Hamiltonian structure, a very canonical Poisson structure, and, uh, you know, all the stuff that, for example, you can find in the work of Palais. So we're wondering, is there something up here that will bring down when you take the limit all the structure, in particular, what happens in the middle? So we decided to formulate four questions. Two, just in any dimension, and the remaining two in dimension one are related to the integrability. So for example, we know that the NLS in any dimension is Hamiltonian, it's an Hamiltonian structure that had not been um, Described at least not until then with the gross Petavieski. So the question is can the gross Petavieski hierarchy be realized as Hamiltonian equation of motion? So this is the way we like to write it. So there is uh, this XHGP, which is the unique Hamiltonian vector field defined by an Hamiltonian, which wasn't written. And then, of course, down here, this gamma is going to be now an infinite dimension. It's not just Function is not just a wave, but because it comes from the hierarchy, it's going to be an infinite vector if you like. And then, can the Poisson structure and the Hamiltonian be derived in a suitable manner from the finite dimension system? This is from the many body, that means from the little wave packets, and there is some kind of limit um, that connects the two. So, this is in any dimension. But then, if we go to dimension one, there is integrability. So does the cubic gross Petavieski hierarchy possess an integrable structure in the sense that, uh, because a little bit back to what uh, we were talking with uh, uh, before, so there exists a sequence of Hamiltonian that was so commute and contain in particular the Hamiltonian that uh, uh, it's related to the first order of energy, H1, if you want. And then if we do have this uh, um, sequence of uh, Hamiltonians, well, of course, the uh, Hamiltonian level, let's say level one, the one that involves one derivative, has attached the Schrodinger equation. But the other Hamiltonians have attached other kind of equation of different order. So do, do we have the same type of uh, uh, setup here? So briefly, and this, of course, is a couple of papers of 90 pages each. So I'm summarizing here just what we proved. And this was again with the Denham Anderson, Andrea Namod, and Natasha Pavlich, and a former student of Natasha and current postdoc of mine, Matt Rosenwig. So the question to the first and second in any dimension was true. So we had we proved that indeed the geometric constructions are based, um, well, are available, they're based in a sort of quantization. There is a lot of algebra involved in those papers. This is not a dynamical type of paper. This is not talking about the dynamics of the, of the equations. It's more on the structure. And also for question three and four about integrability, uh, we proved the same thing. And uh, in a sense now, we are getting closer to the, all the properties that we know for the Hamilton um, in uh, one dimension. Now, I said I will never go deep into anything, so I'm going to switch. Um, I want to go back to the uh, Schrodinger equation. Sorry, in the previous yes. one, do you discover lax pairs? No, we didn't. In fact, we thought that because now we sort of know how to go from the gross Petavisky to the Schrodinger, we thought we could find a generalized thing. We couldn't, and we tried, so we couldn't, yeah. Okay, so the word poseness. Um, as I said, this is a, a system that comes from physics. And in particular, we would like to think of this at the level of uh, making sense of the mass and the energy. So we don't want to go higher in terms of derivatives because that's where the, 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 uh, the um, you know, those are the conservation laws. So in particular, when you see here the Laplacian, we, we don't, we don't want to interpret this as the actual classical Laplacian because we do not have derivative order two. We have derivative order one. That's the maximum we have from the Hamiltonian. So we're going to change this, or at least we're going to interpret it, um, taking, well, solving it in the sense of finding a solution which is unique and stable and so on, as finding the solution of this integral equation. 
Now, this first part is the evolution of the profile with respect to the linear part of the equation. So meaning is a solution of this initial value problem, which is linear. The second part is, of course, the one that contains the nonlinearity. This is like the Duhamel principle that we do for uh, ODE, for example. So for now, the solution will be the solution that satisfies this equation. Of course, this U is in terms of U. So we have, this is the way it is set up. It's perfect for a fixed point uh, here. Okay, so our goal is now to prove that if we consider this right hand side as an operator of U, then this operator has a fixed point. Clearly, uh, this is uh, sure we can do that. The question now is what is the space of functions where the fixed point is going to be uh, applicable in this context? In particular, as you see here, we have to understand how this. Uh, um, uh, interaction of three waves behaves, and that's where harmonic analysis come in. So to identify the space where a fixed point of this operator here lives, well, we'll examine uh, as much as we can the linear part, like we multiply a bunch of linear things and see where they live and so on, with the hope that then this uh, other piece, which is the integral of zero t, although it's nonlinear, is smoother, and in particular, if we are, for example, short time, this is going to be a perturbation of the linear. Okay, so now, now we're going to concentrate on the linear. We try to identify what is the space in which products will make sense, and then show that this operator here is actually a contraction there, and hence so we get a fixed point. And from fixed point, we get uniqueness, we get stability, we get everything. So let's identify the space where this guy behaves well. This brings us to the Strickart's estimates. Now, this, uh, the context in which I work here is the periodic case. Um, so it's gonna be more difficult to obtain the Strickart's estimate. I'm gonna try to explain um, as we go along. Now, what is a typical, and here I'm gonna I just give you an example. What is a typical Strickart's estimate? Well, um, for example, if we go back to this, you have a cubic. You want it to be estimate using duality. So you would like to estimate the product of four functions. So it makes sense to look at Q equals four. So an L4 estimate. Now let's think about a little bit what is this L4? So it's gonna be L4 with respect to the X variables, but also L4 with respect to the time variable. And if you were doing this Strickart's estimate on the whole plane, instead of the periodic case, then you will be able to put here the whole line R, because as I mentioned before, if you don't have boundary conditions, the solution is dispersive, so it goes to zero. So it's feasible that you can integrate on the whole line. But when you have the periodic case, that does not happen, and I will give you an extra uh, justification for that. So we had to cut in time. So we, we take the interval zero, one, and we wanted to estimate that the L4 norm, let's put ourselves in dimension two, the L4 norm is less or equal than some HS norm of initial data. You would like to remain between the mass and the energy, so no more than H1 possible. Now let's write explicitly this linear solution, which you can, because you look at the linear problem, you take Fourier transform, you fix the frequency that becomes an ODE, you solve the ODE, and then you reconstruct via, via anti Fourier transform. So if you do all that process, this is how it looks like the solution. Now, this alpha one and alpha two here are here, and they are positive numbers because the periods in my two dimensional torus might be different. If you have the same period, you will basically have just one number here. But here, the crystal can be different if you have two periods. And in fact, if the ratio between alpha one and alpha two is a rational number, we call the torus rational torus. If it's irrational, we call it an irrational torus. So this will be relevant for what I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Okay, so we, you think, how hard can it be? You have the you know, explicit expression for this. You are multiplying four of them and you should do the, the estimates. Well, the point is that, uh, for example, if you are in R2 instead of tau, the torus of dimension two, this will be an integral with an oscillation. And then you can do a lot of integration by parts. I use oscillatory integrals, and this is actually um, 
in within the, the part of harmonic analysis that say, talks about restric restriction of Fourier transfer on uh, uh, surfaces that have curvature, such as a parabola, as you see here. So there is a lot of stuff that you can do if you are in R2. But if you are in, in the T2, there is a, an oscillatory series. And in fact, the first person who dared to look at this and try to say something was Bougain when he was here. And I was a postdoc. So um, he started, Bourguin started with the rational tori first, and he proved this type of estimate in dimension two. So we take an L4. Now, of course, you have torus of dimension two, but yeah, now you see here that I replaced the interval zero one with a torus itself. Why? Well, it's easy because if you go down here, this is the expression of your linear solution. If you are in a rational torus, you can think of alpha one and alpha two to be natural numbers. So you see that this is also periodic in time. So if you are in the rational torus, you're also periodic in time. Hence, really, if, uh, this is an, another reason why you don't expect L4 for the whole line of time, because you're periodic, you're not decaying. So you really have to cut, and in particular, take the torus here. OK, great. So then um, Burgen is looking at the rational situation. You have um, this is uh, periodic in time. And then actually, after I write the proof, it makes perfect sense. How would you pro proceed? Well, you have an L4 norm here. So just as well, take the L2 of the product of STU0 with STU0, and then take the square root of that. Now you can use the Plancher L and then move from space from uh, the space variable to the frequency variable and then do the convolution and uh, do all that and then you have to do a um, pretty simple strict arts estimate and you end up picking up the following um, quantity so you have to understand how many n in the in the torus in the uh, z2 here are such that this holds where all of these guys are natural number, alpha one, alpha two, and R are all natural number. So how many N1 and two, like the couple, satisfy this? So in other words, how can you write the square of a natural number in the sum of squares and so on? Or in other words, think of this as a, a, a very often time equation and so on. So that's, so the rationality of the torus push the problem into some questions in the pretty uh, elementary number, the analytic number here. Okay, so then you measure what, how big the set can be, and this is some version like that, but the point is with respect to the radius of this uh, um, circle, if you like, it's no more than R to the epsilon. And that's where the epsilon comes here. By the way, if you are in R2, you don't lose the epsilon, you have L2 in there instead of H epsilon. Okay, so in a sense, in order to obtain this strict estimate, which until that moment had been just the topic of harmonic analysis, you use analytic number theory. Well, um, it took about 14 years, um, no, 24 years, sorry, because it was in the early 90s, 20 years about. At Bourguin again, but with the Demeter at that time, um, he proved, they proved the full range of street cards, um, not necessarily just on the rational, um, in the rational tori, but surprisingly no analytic number theory was used. In fact, the, uh, the proof of the street cards were not a direct proof. It's a corollary of an important theorem called the L2 decoupling theorem. And uh, um, this has been a major open conjecture until they worked on this, but as a result of that, they got the street arts estimates. Um, so again, I have not seen yet a direct proof of this uh, um, street arts in, the, in general Torah. And this is uh, the L2 decoupling, it's connected with the Kakea problem, so it's very deep um, harmonic analysis type of thing. Now, I just want to mention, uh, I could say a lot more about this part, but uh, I'm going to just make two things. Um, it turned out that, uh, you remember that uh, um, interval time here? So if you are in, uh, um, has been proved by Dan, Sherman, and Goose, that if you are irrational, the time in which you can prove the strict arts estimates is longer that if you are not, I mean, and what longer means has to be made it clear, but uh, this is enough for now. 
Another thing that I want to remark is that by using the tools that were used in order to prove the L2 decoupling, Burgan, Demeter, and Goost were able to prove a theorem in a, a number theory, which is the Vinograd mean value theorem, which my understanding, it, uh, um, it gives a sharp estimates of the number of solution of a system of a certain diophant time um, type. So at this point, we would like to say the harmonic analysis, it's actually proving theorems in the analytic number theory. And there is this communication between the two. By the way, Larry Root is going to teach a topic course on this this semester. So I'm going to try to attend and learn as much as I can from him. And let me switch gears again. Now that we identify the space where we can actually do our fixed point theorem, we have this strict, it's going to be this, the space given by the strict norms. We can prove the um, fixed point theorem. And going back to the Schrodinger, Schrodinger initial value problem, we have a local will poseness, meaning existence, uniqueness, and the um, stability of solution in HS for S strictly greater than zero. This comes from the fact that there was an epsilon greater than zero on the right-hand side of the street cards. And so, and I wanna mention that, the, and I will go back to this tomorrow, that as for now, we do not know yet whether just having initial data having finite mass, meaning in L2, uh, if just we have that information for the initial data, we cannot claim that there is a unique solution. That's still an open problem. And I will talk about this tomorrow as well. Now, if you lambda is positive, say one here, then you also have um, a bound on the um, energy, so the H1 norm and so on. So um, you can iterate the local well poses because the time will depend on the size of the initial data and this norm. If we have been in L2, then we might iterate there, but we skip, we cannot reach the L2, so we have to use the next conservation law, which is the H1. So using that and iteration from local to global, we can claim that we now have a global well poseness for S greater than or one. You can also go below one a little bit, but that's not important. In particular, if you give me any smooth data, I can tell you that in the defocusing case, in dimension two, any torus, any periodic, I have a global solution, which keeps the same regularity as initial data. Now it comes the uh, next question. Now that you know that you have a global solution, what can you tell me about the behavior of this solution? Just as a uh, comparison, if I were, and maybe I'll say later, so let me see if I say that later. And maybe say later, uh, but let me just anticipate. If you are in R2, we know very well what happens if you have a solution um, with, which uh, is at least um, uh, in HS for S greater or equal than zero. We know that as time goes to plus or minus infinity, that solution becomes linear, become, it gets closer and closer to a linear one. But in the periodic case, that does not happen. So we wanted to understand uh, what we can say about this solution itself. One of the things that people are interested in is the transfer of energy. So let's see what that means. So what I wrote here is the graph of the Fourier coefficient uh, size of that square. It is at time zero. So let's assume that we are at time zero localized to small frequency. The question that we ask is whether this, uh, uh, so this uh, the coefficient is going to move to higher frequency. This is called forward cascade. Um, and it's part of a larger um, group of questions in within the web turbulence and uh, um, in fact, as I will announce in a moment, this will be the content of the third lecture. Now, another question that you can ask is if such a migration happens, so that happens in a kind of disordered way or it happens in a nice way. So these are all questions that becomes more and more complicated, but let's just concentrate on the first one. Um, I have right here, this is the content of the lecture two is uh, uh, the first approach to this question of whether there is a motion from low frequency to high. One way to understand if there is a motion from, uh, in this case, the frequency I call k, from small k to large k is, well, let's hit the guy that we wanted to understand with this weight. So that should emphasize the growth, if there is such a growth, and then let's sum everything. And why do you want to do this? Well, because really by plancher, this is nothing else than the HSI. 
So that's why people are interested as the limit as t goes to plus or minus infinity of the HS norm. Of course, S greater than one, because for L2 and H1, we do have a bound. Now there are, um, this is the approach actually given by Bougain. This is the, the one that was proposed by him. And there are a lot of people that have been working on that and I, should, I, I could keep going here. And this I call the PDE approach, which is very close to the one that I just illustrated briefly in terms of well poses. Then there is also some computational, like uh, really numerical analysis um, that have done that. And then there is a different approach, which is more dynamical system type. And I wrote here, there's a very strong school in Italy that have, but there is no probability here. This is all deterministic stuff. There is another approach. This is uh, the content of lecture number three, which is uh, uh, more sophisticated and uh, um, the gain will be higher if we can make it. Because what this is suggesting is, well, let's just figure out if this quantity actually, which I'm gonna call NTK, and I put it in quotation mark because you actually, I should have put the expectation, but I didn't talk about probability yet. So let's just write it this way for now. So can we actually find an equation for this quantity, right? If we can find an equation, an evolution equation for the quantity, then we know quite a lot more. We don't just know if it moves to high frequency. We can understand the behavior much better. So this is uh, finding an effective dynamics for uh, this quantity. And one um, way of doing it is coming up with what we call the wave kinetic equation for this quantity. But um, we need to introduce quite a lot of other um, tools. In particular, we need to um, introduce some probability. We need to make the nonlinearity weaker. So that lambda that was in front, that I said until now was either plus or minus one. Well, that lambda is going to go to zero. And we're going to need to do some kind of limit uh, approach. And um, I will, that will be the content of lecture 13, but I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, what that lecture is going to be. Maybe say one word, what is what you make random? Yes, the random will be you randomize initial data. That's the usual way, but as I will explain in lecture number three, depending on what kind of dispersal equation you have, the dispersal relation might be singular too much, and then you need to also add okay, so the initial data. The initial data is the typical way. Yeah. Okay, so this I introduce a little bit who are the first people that uh, um, um, uh, proposed the equation that this quantity should satisfy. And by the way, uh, this, for you might recognize this name, Hasselman is one of the Nobel Prize in physics a year, two years ago, and for climate studies. So this equation, surprisingly, the one that I will introduce in a second, it's used a lot in the climate science and uh, um, so on. Okay, so uh, briefly, the approach, let's see, approach number one, this is the growth of the Sobolev norms. This is the one that Bruggen um, started initiated. And there are a couple of facts that are true from the beginning. Like if you are in dimension one and you look at the cubic NLS or the KDD, um, then there is no problem. All the HS norms are gonna be bounded at least when S is a natural number because that comes from the uh, conservation laws. So that comes from, on the other hand, what I was saying before, when you are not in the periodic setting, but you are in R2, for example, let's stay in dimension two, well, there is scar um, will approximate a linear one, meaning that you can find a profile, I'm looking at plus infinity here, you can say the same amount as infinity. I can find a profile U plus, which is in HS, such that the difference between your nonlinear solution and the linear evolution of U plus in the normal HS goes to zero as t goes to infinity. This is actually a pretty recent result of Dobson. We didn't know this in dimension two for a long time. And so when t is very large, while you do triangular inequality, this part is gonna be small, this part is uh, the linear part, the linear operator is uh, unitary, so this remains constant and it's going down. So you will not ask the question of uh, forward cascade, neither in our, in, uh, when you don't have boundary conditions, neither when you, have, you are integrable. Okay, um, so but when you ask this question, then you uh, have two sub questions. So first you wanted to understand how much 
the sobolev norms can grow. And so far, um, I think this is the best bound. So if you're looking at the HS norm, then you have a polynomial bound with degree of S. But in lecture two, I will show you that this can be much improved if you are very rational in a sense. Um, so there are some works here that some people that work on that. Um, and uh, I, I want to mention that if you are, there's some work here of Deng, Sherman, and Good to say if you are irrational, then this bound is better. And then we have more recent works where it's uh, just basically linear. So that's what does very irrational mean? <laughs> exactly. You have to wait tomorrow's lecture for that. <laughs> yeah. So that's a very interesting question, actually, because at the moment, um, you basically don't approximate well with the fraction. Oh, so it can be. Can you do scooters? Oh, very good question. People have asked that, and uh, I have not. Uh, the, yeah, we don't have a precise result on this exactly. Or other kind of configurations, once we, yes, that would be. In fact, that's kind of relevant for applied math. They have materials that, uh, that have these different configurations and uh, how this wave behaves and the Weinstein is actually working on that. Okay, so uh, on the other hand, do we actually have a solution that grows? Because so far, you know, um, and unfortunately, that's not obvious either. There are two results in that direction, and one says, and this is with the IT, in fact, some time ago, it says the following. Um, we can construct, so you give me an order on a linear, let's fix S scale than one. You give me a small quantity, then you give me a large quantity. Then in the rational case, I can construct for you an initial data with this regularity, which is small than delta when you start, and if you wait a very long time, it becomes large than K. But we don't, know, we don't know what happens after capital T. We don't know if we can put this bunch of this solution together to actually at least have a log growth, none of that. And then there is another result along these lines, also in the rational case of a different flavor. This is just a, a construction, again, a solution which is low frequency, uh, such that if you look at any other frequency larger, if you wait long enough, there is something left over. Okay, now some remarks. I already said we don't know anything what happens after capital T. Um, and in the work of Carl and Fau, um, and in our work, both of them are rational, and there is a constructor of a, 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 what's important is a, a spatial set lambda, which is when uh, you can imagine you expect the growth to happen from resonance, so it's in within the resonance frequency. And then what happens when the, the torus is irrational? Well, there is some work by myself and Bobby Wilson um, that says that the construction done for the rational case just cannot happen in the irrational one. Like, you know, that construction cannot happen, doesn't mean it doesn't grow. But the more after our work, Giuliani and Guardia proved that you can perturb this result in the rational case. And actually, if you are close enough to be uh, a rational torus, irrational, but close enough to be rational in whatever way, um, you can use that result to also prove that there is this kind of uh, growth here for a some irrational torus. Okay. Now, um, I want to just mention two words about the second approach, which will be the content of uh, um, lecture number three. So just like lecture number two will give you a much deeper um, presentation of what I just said, um, lecture number four is going to give you a much, uh, sorry, not number three, no four. I'm not going to, sorry, I'm not going to stay here for <laughs> well, <it's> a new <laughs> lecture. <laughs> okay, so this, um, Peter was asking, before also what's, uh, what's the, where the probability, probability comes from. So briefly, this is what's happening. So you have U, which is a solution of dispersive equation. Let's call AK the Fourier coefficient. And let's start with uh, time zero, um, independent random variables, okay? And now let's call NKT. Before I said that was the absolute value of the Fourier coefficient square, but really now we can actually talk about the expectation of that. So we need to use probability. And then take some limits. Um, so what kind of limits? 
In general, the, uh, the lambda that is in front of the nonlinearity will go to zero. That's called weak nonlinearity. Another limit is that you start in a box of size L and then you take L that goes to infinity. Those are the two kind of limits that uh, you have to take in which order and how you will learn about in the third lectures. Um, and um, at the end of that process, um, you get what we call the wave kinetic equation. And how does it look like? Looks like this. At least for the NLS, we look like derivative with respect to T of N, of course, depend on the frequency. And then here there is this uh, um, operator called collision operator that I just give you the representation that is some delta function. This is the this is typical of the, uh, maybe the most important thing to remark is that this is typical of the NLS because it's exactly the parabola that's attached to the dispersion relation in the NLS. If you are in a different, looking at the KDV, for example, is a different one. Um, so some recent results on this. How should I think of this equation? What is it? Say it again? How should I think of the, on the previous slide? What, what's the intuition? I don't um, yeah, one thing that you can think about here, if you replace the phi one, phi two, and phi three with n, this they call the four wave interactions. So you have an outgoing wave that's n, and then these guys are the ones. So it's the interaction of waves. Um, and uh, for example, one spatial solution of this is the Kolmogorov um, uh, exponent, exponent that lots of people find when they represent the energy spectrum of a bunch of experiments. Okay, so there has been quite a lot of activities on this um, in recent times, but I want to go back to Lucarin and Spawn. I would say they are the first people who actually approached the nonlinear problem. Originally, the linear one with a, a random potential was by by Spawn and uh, Salmofer and uh, um, Erdosiao, so different kind of works. But in the nonlinear case, I will start with Lucarin and Spawn, but they were at statistical equilibrium, meaning that the probabilistic measure that they used was the, the one that is invariant is the Gibbs measure. And there is some work of Fau, and then really started with uh, Bachmaster Germain, Hanen Chata, and Danganani, and Colo Germain. So these are the more recent one. And there are off, out of statistical equilibrium. So this is really random data, and not necessarily with a spe that specific probability. And uh, um, this is something, uh, this is a different kind of equation. I've been talking only about the NLS so far, but this is now the ZK equation. So it's basically a KDV equation, except that it's in a higher dimension. So usually you're, you're uh, used to see here a derivative of order three, um, that's in one dimension, but now if you are in higher dimension, you have that. It's a quadratic nonlinearity. Um, and I uh, think I'm running out of time since I'm gonna, um, I mean, how much, actually, how much time do I have? I'm done, right? Well, I, I have a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay, then I'm not running out of time. I can finish the slides. <laughs> okay, good. So this is a different kind of equation and uh, the same kind of, a uh, question that you want to ask is, do you have an effective equation for the expectation of the Fourier coefficient? Now, I wanted to mention that this is exactly the kind of equation that, for example, Nazarenko in his book, he's a physicist, used in order to derive in a formal way the, kinet the wave kinetic equation. And I will show you that formal way next time, so that's our lecture. And I will show you how going from the formal to the actual mathematical derivation, there is quite a lot of work to be done. But this is the equation that he used in, in, in his uh, um, uh, book, and that's where I learned it from. OK, so again, you start with the Fourier coefficient. You assume that R, this is what I read from his book, RPA fields. That means random phase and amplitude. So you think of them like, a, if you like, in polar coordinates. You look at this in a torus, actually, in a work that we did, it's a discrete, right? let's think of a torus of dimension B, and you take the limit first as B goes to infinity and then lambda goes to zero, and there it pops the, uh, again, the wave kinetic equation. By the way, I call it here Q because since we have a, a quadratic nonlinearity, this Q operator is no longer four wave interaction, but it's gonna be three wave interaction. 
one up going at two in time, or two in, okay. Um, and as I uh, anticipated a little bit before, um, in the work that I did of the actual derivation of the wave kinetic equation with my collaborator, Bin Tran, well, you would have liked to stop here, but like in the uh, formal derivation of uh, Nazarenko, but unfortunately, because the Fourier, well, because it's here, the dispersed relation is pretty singular, we couldn't actually do the, the whole derivation there. We have to add uh, this, don't worry about the notation, but this is the, think of it just as some noise. It's a stochastic part also with a lambda in front. So it goes away when you take the limit. And this um, is gonna be the theorem that I will prove in the third lecture. It tells you exactly what you would like to prove is that the expectation of Fourier coefficient square, and that's another way of writing. Um, as you take the limit as the box goes to infinity and the lambda, the coefficient of military goes to zero, it tends to the solution of the wave kinetic equation. And this is going to be done in within what we call the kinetic time, which is lambda to the minus two. And it's important that you are in this time. Okay, I want to conclude with uh, this phrase that I learned from uh, looking at the uh, uh, phrases that people say. And it was particularly important because it comes from Paul Mogorov, who just worked quite a lot in this, uh, um, uh, let's call, call wave turbulence. So mathematics is vast. One person is unable to study all its branches. That's definitely true. In this sense, specialization is inevitable. But at the same time, mathematics is a um, united science. More and more links appear between its areas. And I hope I show you some of them, sometimes in a most unexpected way. Some areas serve as tool for others. Therefore, an isolation mathematician in a too narrow border should be destructive for our science. So I'm gonna close here. Thank you. Questions? Uh, I have a question. So in this fixed point theorem that you proved, it seems to me that the estimate that you needed doesn't mean use the nonlinearity. So oh yes. You get fixed point theorems for more general numbers. Yeah. So the estimate that I did was to identify what is the norm that you want to use to apply the fixed point in. So that will, in other words, that will be sort of the L4 norm. That's the, the, the right one. But why is, we might think, why is the L4 and not something else? So if you think of the nonlinearity, you wanted to estimate it in, in some norm, you want to use, you want to use, for example, a duality. So you're going to end up from to the product of three times one, which is the dual function. You're going to have L4 of them, four, four functions. And then you do holder, you have an L4 for each one of them. So that's definitely useful for the, cube, for the cubic. Of course, there are other norms that you can use. So basically, that norm allows you to control the cubic nonlinearity in this Banach space, which is the one of the L4. Another way of thinking about it is that you can also, instead of fixed point, think about doing an iteration. So for example, you just like you're doing ODE for nonlinear ODE. So you have the first element of your sequence is the solution of the linear problem. The second element is gonna be the solution of the Duhamel where you replace nonlinearity with the first one. And so you need to be able to estimate three linear solutions even at the first step, and then you keep going with that. I did I answer your question? I think so, yeah. Uh, actually, I got a little lost. Uh, I thought you were talking only about toruses. Yes. But somewhere in there, there was also some RRM. Right. So Because they're very different. Exactly. And so. I, I added to that was really the question that kind of uh, always disappoints me. The answer always disappoints me. So I hope you give me a different answer, which is, is do you ever look at any of Manifold. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. No, there are. There are yeah. people look at other manifold. The thing is that, for example, if you if you look at other manifold, like a, I don't know, like even just a take a torus and you perturb a little bit yeah, yeah. the you know tiny smooth thing. For example, for the Schickard system, as far as we know, now you go from uh, having on the right hand side h to the epsilon to have h to the one quarter. Yeah. Even by perturbing an the matrix tiny. Why? 
because when you do the torus, rational and irrational, you uh, can use these tools of uh, a harmonic analysis, Fourier transform, blah, blah, blah. And when you just perturb a tiny bit, you lost all of those tools. But I believe should be the same. But I, I, I see. You mean you can only prove. You can only you prove. You can only prove. You don't. You, uh, okay. Yeah. So that's the problem. Is that the? Uh, it's a. Pretty, in my view, the the torus as it is, is a very rigid. I mean, at least the tools that we are using are pretty rigid, in a sense. So we change manifold, even or the matrix on the torus by a tiny bit. Um, those tools. So they're not perturbative in a sense. Yes. yes they just fall apart. Yeah. But I think physically. Physically, yeah, physically that shouldn't be. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, on the other hand, physically, the. the, the At least for the, some. But, but, but I mean, this is associated with the difference between rational and irrational. Yes. I mean, which should somehow physically shouldn't. That's be. correct, because they, how do you make a tank? Yeah. yeah, yeah. How, how, do, how do you really know the difference? In yes. Okay. Yes, yes. But I, even numerically, you do see the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you are very rational, you see one thing. If you rational, you know. And you say, how do you do numerically the rational thing? They can only do the very rational number somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question. So, since you mentioned like some like geometry and mm. dimensional system, mm -hmm. um, I, I am familiar with some. Papers in which they actually use techniques coming from Earth theory to you know, to that there exist solutions to Schrodinger equations. For example, if you start just with the Laplacian so you know, non linearity and then you solve it, and then you add the non linearity and then you use some deformation arguments. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you do, or something that? In a sense, that's in a sense in a different maybe in a different word, different names or something. That's what we do. Like we do perturb the linear part with the nonlinearity. Basically, that's that's what the fixed point we are able. So this fixed point argument or the iteration argument, whatever you want to do, it is a perturbation of the linear. And in fact, only works if you are in small time or you can rescale things to have small data, all of that. If you want to do global things, that's not worth the tools. They are too weak. Cannot do it. You had to really use nonlinear analysis. Um, it seems that this method might apply for some of the formation uh, situations. So um, going back to the um, result on the norm inflation. Yes. Yes. Do, you, do I understand correctly? There is a big discrepancy between the yes. upper bound and lower bound. So do you know that there is at least some initial data whose norm is going to infinity, or or not right. know that. So um, the the place where we know there is no gap anymore, and we can actually it, it goes back to Bruegel, but then it was um, further um, added by the the team in Italy that I mentioned. There, it's a linear with the potential. In that case, you know that it cannot grow more than a log or t to the epsilon. And you can exhibit a solution that goes like that. Another place in which people do see a growth of the Sobler norm, and it's a, a case in which the domain is a mixed manifold. You have like a torus, and then you have the, the line. So um, you have, let's say you are in dimension three, you have a x1, x2 in the torus, and then x3 is on the line. That's a result of Zahir Hani and Panchon, and now I cannot remember that bunch of authors there. Those are the only, as far as I know, cases in which you can say something about the growth. In terms of the torus, dimension two cubic, we do not have anything that uh, we can exhibit that grows, like, even like logarithmic. So, in principle, it would stay bound? In principle. Um, and and uh, uh, is it expected that the upper bound is sharp or? Uh, so I think people expect that should be log. Uh -huh. okay. Or some, you know, some log version of it. Yeah. Uh, but now, so no it's, even. It's, so it's expected to grow and it's expected to grow. Yes. Right? And of course, it's expected that you can find some solution that grows. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. yeah.
Okay, uh, so um, if there's no other question, thanks.